months later demonstrate that you have spent the dollars that were borrowed on those payroll costs, chances are that 100% of the loan will be forgiven. So essentially, you got a grant from the government um, instead of a loan. Um, forgiveness is based on the employer maintaining or quickly rehiring employees and maintaining salary levels and forgiveness will be reduced if full-time headcount declines uh, or if salaries and wages decrease so there's going to be an audit eight weeks after you receive after you are funded um, and there, the bank is going to want you to demonstrate that you um, did not terminate people and did not reduce their salaries by more than 25 percent and if you can demonstrate that then um, there's a good chance that your, your loan will be forgiven. Let's move on to the next slide, please, Erica. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to say to all business owners is if you're thinking about borrowing money um, through this program, the most important thing to do is to get informed. So I provided two very important links here. Um, the first one is, will take you to the overview page uh, of, that is published by the SBA, um, and you could, you could get to this page just by Googling SBA PPP. And this is the front page where it's providing the very high level information about what the program is. Um, and so the, the purpose of the program is to cover um, uh, payroll costs and those other costs that I mentioned, mortgage interest, rent, and utilities, during this period while um, the, the economy is disrupted by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and so this, uh, the first page will just provide some high level details about that. The second link that I have provided is much more detailed, and this is the interim final rule. These are the ground rules for administering the program. So uh, I was saying I received a, a, a 31 page version of this. Uh, it's condensed into a seven page version if you click this link, but it's seven pages of fine print, but this is where you can find a lot of the details on what applies to you and how you should um, uh, uh, create the application that's appropriate for your business, stay within the rules, maximize your loan amount, maximize your forgiveness. So I'm going to walk you through some of the high level details here. But as you are preparing your application, I highly encourage you to read both of these. Um, and if you have resources like an advisor or a CPA or an attorney, it probably doesn't, especially if you're applying for a large dollar amount, probably doesn't hurt to run this by them as well. Um, you can also bounce ideas off of each other. You know, many of you are, are close business owners who have good relationships with each other. Um, I know that David and Michael have both gone through the process. Um, so they know a little bit about, you know, what they did when they applied. So I encourage you to talk to each other as well. Um, but this interim final rule is, is, those are the rules. So you can go through it. And if you have a unique situation, try to come through that and find, um, you know, what, what applies to you specifically. Um, the other bullets that I have here say complete your application and gather your supporting documentation. So if you are thinking about applying, um, in the, the first link that I provided is the general overview of the program. And the actual, the most current application is on there. You can download that fill it in and have it ready to hand to your banker, which I would encourage everyone, if you are seriously thinking about doing this, do it tonight, get in touch with your banker tonight, you know, get everything ready. Um, they're not able to submit an application right now to the SBA, but as soon as it gets turned on, they probably already have a backlog of hundreds of these. So you want to get in the queue. I would, if you're thinking about doing this, um, I would encourage you to get the application, uh, fill it out properly to the best of your ability and get it to your banker. Um, and so my final bullet on anchor and submit your application um, and David and I were talking about this before the presentation started uh, he said that you know part of his success with, uh, with the program was being persistent and as a banker who is receiving lots of these I would say that is very very important because there are there are hundreds of applications that are pouring in to every bank in the country basically so you do want to be the squeaky wheel that gets the oil um, and it's not a guarantee that you're going to be the, you know, in the group that gets approved, um, but persistence is, is going to pay off. And I'd just like to revisit um, the third bullet here, gather your supporting documentation. I'll just touch on that briefly. So basically the way that the program is designed is that you are applying to have certain costs covered over uh, the next eight weeks. Um, 
from when you get your funding until an eight week period elapses and then you're going to ask for the bank to forgive 100% or a portion of the loan, okay? So basically, the simplest form of your application would be this. You want um, your payroll costs to be covered um, for the next two weeks, or I'm sorry, for the next two months. So let's say that your payroll, the people that you're paying is uh, $10,000 per month. And so you're going to want, want to gather your supporting documentation. And I would say the best form of supporting documentation would be um, uh, 12, the 12 previous months of IRS quarterly payroll tax reports. They are called 941s. And that's how people who have employees um, report to the government how much they are paying their people. Um, there are other forms of documentation are acceptable, um, including a, a payroll report from your bookkeeping system. Um, if you're a 1099 person, you know, your 1099 from 2019 would be satisfactory. Um, and again, these, this information is going to be covered in that um, interim final rule. Um, document. But uh, getting back to the simplest form of application, you're going to look at what your payroll is over the past, over the period that you're calculating based on. Let's say it's um, the past 12 months and you average it out and say, okay, on average, I pay my people $10,000 per month. The maximum that you can apply for based only on payroll is two and a half times that amount. So in that case, you would put on in, on the application, you'll see it's not a very complex application. It says, what is your monthly average payroll amount times 2.5? That's your maximum loan amount. And then that's what you're going to be sending to your, your banker and saying, this is the amount that I want. Now, other costs can also be included in that, including mortgage interest, rent, and utilities. Um, when you're filling out the application, it does say only my monthly payroll cost. Um, but you can lump in those other costs into your average, call it average costs, if you want those other costs to be covered. Um, and then that would be your monthly average costs for everything, times two and a half. That's the maximum amount that you can apply for. Now, two, eight weeks after you are funded and the clock starts ticking on the day you receive your money, um, the you're going to go to your banker and say, I want this money to be forgiven. And they're going to ask you to provide documentation for the costs that you actually spent over that eight week period. Um, and if in the simplest example, if you said, I expect my monthly payroll costs are $10,000 per month. Think about this. You know, when you go to get the money forgiven, you're going to want those to match. And if they match and it was just for payroll, then hundred percent is going to be forgiven. So, if you know the maximum that you can apply for according to the application is 2.5 times, it allows you a little bit of a cushion. But if you said my monthly payroll costs were $10,000 and then over two months you spent $20,000, but you applied for a loan that was $25,000, there's going to be a difference there. So there's going to be $5,000 left over, in which case that would then convert into the the, to a loan. Now, if you hadn't spent that money on payroll, you could conceivably take the $5,000 and just pay it back. Okay. So that's, that's the simplest form of, of how you um, would calculate your loan amount. And then eight weeks later, apply for forgiveness. Um, now the, the other costs, you can include um, utilities, mortgage interest, and rent. Um, but when you go to ask for forgiveness, only 25% of the amount that will be forgiven can be for those costs. So if you're including, if you're asking for a loan to cover a large amount of rent or a large amount of mortgage interest or a large amount of utilities, just know that um, only 25% of the amount that will be forgiven it can be for those costs. Okay. Um, let's jump over to the next slide, and this here is where we will talk about forgiveness. Okay, so and here we're, I'm going to be touching on some of the thing, points that I have just uh, talked about. But calculate the appropriate loan amount for your business. Um, you know, there's two ways to look at this. One is I want to, you may want to apply for just the maximum amount that you can get. In which case you would. You could, here's how you would do the maximum amount that you can apply for, is you would calculate how much am I paying my people, 
how much am I paying for mortgage interest on a monthly basis? How much am I paying for utilities? And how much am I paying for rent? <laughs> Calculate the monthly average times 2.5. That's the most you can apply for. But though all of those costs may not be forgiven. So my second bullet point here is determine the amount that you desire to be forgiven and any amount you are comfortable with not being forgiven. So if your goal at this point is just to get the maximum amount of dollars through the door, if a business is really shut down, a restaurant or a bar, and you're not generating any revenue and you're on the brink, you need to get the maximum amount of dollars in the door. And at, in the future, you'll worry about you know, a portion of that not being forgiven because a lot of it was for rent or mortgage interest or utilities. And then you pay it back over a two-year period. And the terms are very generous. So if you do apply for a lot and a portion of it is not forgiven, you know, you, you may, you're not going to be burned so bad because the interest rate is 1% on this. No payments are due for, for six months. And then after that, you have two years to pay it back. So it's a, it's a balancing act where you want to be thinking about, okay, do I want to have maximized my forgiveness or do I want to maximize the, uh, the loan amount and getting the dollars in the door? Um, and then the, my third bullet here is track the amounts that you spend from the PPP loan proceeds uh, on the covered costs over the eight weeks following the funding of your loan. So a good way to do this is if you are approved and you're they're sending you your document and you're going to sign your, if you're signing your documents, you're probably going to be funded that day. It would be good to have a checking account or a separate account uh, where you're just going to plunk down your PPP dollars and then spend out of that. And that way you have a nice clean record. So when you go back and ask for forgiveness, you can say, okay, these are the costs that I paid. Um, you can demonstrate this one was for payroll. This one was for mortgage interest, utilities, et cetera. Um, and then they're all in a separate account. And then after the eight week period, you will contact your lender and say, okay, you know, I would like to apply for forgiveness. I will tell you that the rules on forgiveness have not been published yet. If you read that interim rule that I published earlier or that I included in the slideshow earlier, it refers to um, the SBA will, will publish rules on forgiveness in the future. So, you know, the bankers don't know exactly how it's going to be. Um, the forgiveness, forgiveness is going to be calculated or what documentation is going to be required. But what I would say is that if you can demonstrate, um, you know, that the, the costs have been paid, that's probably going to be good enough here. The SBA doesn't want to hold people's feet to the fire and the banks don't want to hold people's feet to the fire, but they do want you to be honest. So if you provided utility bills going in and say, I want my utility costs to be covered over the next eight weeks. Here are my bills for, you know, three months worth of utilities. When you go in and ask for forgiveness, you know, up to 25% of the forgiveness amount can be for utilities. So you would probably want to have a similar utility bill that shows, okay, over the eight week period, these were my utility bills. And this is the amount that I paid. Similarly with payroll, you know, you're, you're going to want to, this is an important point, you're going to want to show that you did not terminate people and you did not reduce salaries. So if you go in and you say, my payroll costs that I'm basing my loan amount were $10,000 per month, my average payroll cost. And then you go eight weeks later and say, well, I fired everybody and I reduced salaries by 50%. Um, and, and you demonstrate, you know, you provide a uh, uh, your payroll reports and it shows, okay, well, you only paid $2,500 a month uh, over the eight week period. Then that, you know, the amount that you borrowed is not going to be forgiven. So that is, this is a high level of, of how the program works. Um, and I'll open it up to uh, Michael and David if they have anything to add or uh, if anyone has questions for me. So maybe one of the first things is that I think we have the wrong link for that um, the final instructions website. Even the ones that were put up in the chat room don't seem to be the right document. The final rules. Yeah, so we we'll, we'll have to get back to folks with that link. We had a couple questions there, uh, Andy. Um, the first one uh, I saw is, are only the funds paid out in the first eight weeks forgiven, providing those criteria met, of course? So uh, the question is, when are the funds forgiven? So only funds that are paid out during that eight-week period. 
Correct. That's correct. And it, do you set your own eight-week period? The eight-week period begins when you are funded, when you receive the dollars into your checking account. Okay. By the way, that the interim final rule, if the link is not working, you can go to the, the main page, which I included the other link for, um, and scroll down until you find the interim final rule. I just pasted a copy that worked for me into the chat. Great. Thank you. That thing, that rule is so uh, useful. I mean, because it spells out from the SBA how they want it to be administered. So you can get a lot of information about, you know, how to follow the rules and, and apply properly. We did get a question, can medical insurance be covered? I believe it can. So can I answer that? I was given a spreadsheet by our banker to fill out in order to figure out the loan um, amounts. And there was an individual line for payments required for the provision of health care benefits, including insurance premiums. So that was a line that was allowed as a payroll cost, as well as any payments to retirement benefits. And then, of course, state and federal taxes. Mm -hmm. Um, would it be helpful for Michael and David to share their experience now with, with how they applied for the loan and what happened there? Yeah, um, I applied for the loan on April 3rd, which I believe was the day they started accepting applications. Um, I bank with a small bank here in Santa Clarita that's uh, just a small local bank. Um, but fortunately, they're connected with the SBA, so they were able to walk me through the process um, they had a sort of a teleconference like this um, in the afternoon, and the second the teleconference was over, I had my application filled out by submitting it to them. Um, and then it began basically two and a half weeks of waiting. Um, about three days ago, they asked me to come in and sign some documents, and I signed them, and then we were funded um, just last night. Um, there, I will say that, um, as Andy mentioned earlier, I had to be persistent. The bank did not communicate with us a lot. Um, they would, as a matter of fact, the, the um, email they sent me where they told us that we were approved had approved in the subject line how much we were approved for, and there was no body in the email. So they're really overwhelmed. They're really just trying to keep on top of it all. Um, I tried not to bug them too much, but every few days I'd be like, hey, what's going on? And I sometimes get back a one-line email, you know, you're still in, still in the queue. So have, have patience with the process. We also applied for the um, EIDL $10,000 grant. And when that was announced, they said they were going to get them approved within three days. And I think that took us nine days. I'm sorry, no, that took us 14 days. So all of these processes are taking longer than anybody expected. And so, you know, in my experience, be patient, be persistent. Um, if you're lucky, you have a banker who, if you know your banker, they're more likely to communicate with you. So it's great if you have a relationship with somebody already. I would say that's extremely important. If you know someone, if you have a relationship, that's who you want to be submitting your application to. Um, because otherwise, you're just going to be one of hundreds and they don't know how to pri prioritize it. You know, it's probably going to be prioritized based on when it was received. But if you have a relationship with someone, you know, maybe you can say, hey, um, you know, can you try to get me in? Yeah, and then and we're all, at it, all, all of us who are small businesses are at a disadvantage right now. Um, last night they announced there's a class action lawsuit that's happening because <clears throat> a lot of lenders were prioritizing their bigger clients because they get better origination fees for those clients because they're bigger loans. And so, of course, they're going to prioritize them. That makes business sense. But it leaves the smaller companies kind of at the bottom of the pile. And uh, that's why being a squeaky wheel helps. Agree. And uh, one other point I would make about when you're submitting your application is, you know, over document, uh, you know, it's it, it, first of all, fill out the application uh, properly so they don't have to go back to you and say, you didn't add your social security number or, you know, this is not initial. Make sure that it's filled out um, accurately. Um, if when in doubt, you know, include additional information. Um, I would include, you know, anything you need to sign legal paperwork. So include a copy of your driver's license front and back. Um, if you're 
uh, an entity, you know, include an operating agreement for your LLC that says who can sign the loan papers. If you're a corporation, you know, you, sh you should include your corporate bylaws and meeting minutes, um, you know, anything that's going to um, help smooth the process along so that they don't have to come back to you. Because it may be a situation where they're overwhelmed and they say, we've got two applications here. One is, has we have complete documentation, driver's licenses, organizational documents. This one just has the application. Um, and which one do you think they're going to process? So, you know, be prepared, over document. Um, it, it really can't hurt to have like too much stuff in there. But if they have to go back to you, that could, you know, jeopardize your chances of getting processed. So I had a similar situation to David, except I have not been approved yet. <laughs> so um, our bank, which is a, a sort of a regional bank in this area, is also a, a SBA lender, and we have a 29-year relationship with them, um, started taking applications on the 6th of April, which was the second business day that uh, they were able to file applications. So we got ours in within the first three hours of them accepting applications. But again, they were overwhelmed, and it. Uh, I think our... Um, uh, direct uh, loan advisor had a large pile on her desk and it went, uh, took a couple of days to get off of her desk before it went to their processors. And I kept checking in and very politely kept nudging them. But um, I finally heard last Thursday that I did not make it into the first round and wanted to make sure that our paperwork was all set so that I'd be ready to go into the second round. It was just learned yesterday that it, it, it was ready and um, I am assured but I'm not sure it will actually happen that it will go up right away once they reopen so um, again had to sort of nudge nicely along the way even though we've had a long-term relationship with this banker. So that actually might answer a question that we had in the chat Michael um, which was if you weren't approved for round one do you need to submit another application? Is the answer then to check with your bank that you originally submitted with? Well, we were we did not submit. It actually stayed at the bank or it never got submitted to the SBA. So I wouldn't call it having been submitted. So I'm not sure if that question relates to having already been submitted and did not get it. Or, you know, if that is the case, I would say, yeah, it can get resubmitted and into the next round. I would assume I have to go through the same process. Andy, do you know if, we, if it's, it got submitted and missed out that it would have to be resubmitted or is it already in the SBA's queue? Okay, so in, in our case, we had a backlog of loans that did not get processed and those were currently working on queuing those up. Um, so those people did not resubmit to us. Um, we have their application um, and we're we're loading those up so that when it gets opened up, we just hit a button and they go and get approved. So in our case, they did not resubmit. Now, you know, if you have no idea where your application stands and you can't get a hold of someone, you know, you may want to resubmit. But it, the best thing to do would be, you know, the ideal situation would be you contact someone and they say, tell you what I just told you, which is we have your application. Um, it, you don't need to resubmit. We're queuing you up and we're going to, submit. Now, if you're working with like a regional bank and you really cannot get anyone on the phone, then I would say go ahead and resubmit. And actually, I was on a conference last week or webinar where um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and they said you can actually submit to multiple banks. And because your identifi identifying materials will be the same, if one bank gets it, if another bank submits, they'll, they'll be told it's already been accepted by another bank. So you can submit if you're feeling like your bank is not responsive enough and you want to try another bank or maybe try a local bank, um, you might be able to do that. And uh, it, won't, it doesn't penalize you. You won't get in trouble for applying twice. There, there actually, David, there is, you don't want to apply twice. So you don't want to be approved twice through two different banks. Right. And you are certified. So my understanding is. Submit the application that you're only submitting one, so. Oh, interesting. Okay, that, that's contradictory to what I heard last week because like they said if you apply to two different banks, the first bank that approves it, when the second bank submits it, they'll be told it's already been submitted and they won't be allowed to resubmit it. So I, I would probably 
pay more attention to what you just said than than what I heard last week, but uh, it sounds wiser. Uh, we have a couple more complicated questions in the in the chat group. Um, Andy, can you see any of them? I, I saw the one about part time employees. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to go back to that one. Can you read that? Where is it? Let's see if I can find it. I think I see it from Todd Zimmerman. Yeah. What is? Do we anticipate gross payroll costs will be utilized for forgiveness? Or will it be on the by employee basis? Meaning, can I pay part time employees during this eight weeks, or is it only for full time equivalent? Uh, it's so it's for it, it doesn't matter if they're full time or part time, but if you were paying, you want the levels to be relatively similar. So if you were paying three full time employees, a total of $10,000, and then one part time employee, $5,000 on average over the past 12 months, and your documentation shows that, then you're going to want to show eight weeks from now that you paid those people a similar amount. So you don't want to go back and say, okay, now I've reduced someone to part time because that amount won't be forgiven. Now, again, that might not be the worst thing in the world because it's at 1% and it's generous repayment terms. But if you are trying to maximize forgiveness, then you want the amounts the levels to be re relatively similar. Awesome. Um, we had another question. Uh, this individual wrote, I know there's a $100,000 limit per employee for the PPP loan. The loan is for 2.5 times your payroll up to $100,000. Can you use 75% of that loan dedicated to payroll to cover amounts over $100,000 per person? Uh, so essentially covering employees to their full salary if they make over $100,000 a year? No, you don't want, no. that's not how, it, so basically if you have employees who are making over $100,000 per year, you want to, when you're calculating your average monthly payroll cost, you want to exclude the amount that they are being paid over $100,000. Mm -hmm. So if you only have one employee and he's making one fifty, on, then you want to, Calculate him based on he's only making one hundred thousand, which would be eight eight thousand three hundred thirty three dollars per month. That would be your average monthly payroll cost. So, Andy, does that include taxes, et cetera? Uh, you want to be calculating off of the gross amount. Okay, so the gross amount, including taxes, health insurance, and um, any retirement plans, is a hundred thousand. That's the amount that you're paying him? No, I'm saying you're paying him more than that. Oh, so okay. do you just take 100 from the take-home salary and then add taxes and other benefits on top of that or not? No, his total payroll, his or her total payroll is 100. Total compensation that he's receiving. Okay. And we actually just did our first payroll today. Um, under the, the the program, and what we did is for any employees that are earning more than a hundred thousand, we split their paycheck into two paychecks. So one paycheck will be funded entirely out of the PPP, and the other will be funded out of our existing bank account. Um, so they're completely separate. All the benefits and four hundred one k matching and all of that will be separated. Um, so only the amount up to a hundred thousand will come out of the PPP, which will be clean for forgiveness. The, at the yeah. forgiveness. We're trying to maximize that. Yeah. And, and uh, our, I know you mentioned this already, Andy, but our, we had several advisors say very strongly, open a new bank account, put the entire PPP into that new bank account, keep it separate, track it separately. Um, it'll really help when you need to document it at the end when you're audited. Agree strongly with that. Uh, I see a question from Tom Zoller. Uh, Part-time employees, does it matter if the employee is an independent contractor. If they're a 1099 employee, you do not want to include them in your um, payroll, average monthly payroll cost calculation. And that, so you can advise that person that they can apply for the PPP loan on their own. They yeah. would submit their own PPP application. Would you mind touching you would on not that? Andy. Sorry. Would you mind touching on the, the 1099 a little more? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so if you're a 1099 um, independent contractor, I have received many of those. Um, those folks are are pay, uh, providing you know their own PPP application based on the amount that they were 1099 in 2019. So some of them are just providing their 2019 1099, basing you know their average uh, monthly income on on that times 2.5 times. That's the maximum loan amount that they can apply for, and then. At the end of the eight-week period, you know, we're going to ask them to provide documentation um, for the amount that they actually were paid. Okay. Um, we have a question from John Beckman, a little higher up in the chat. Uh, as a pair of independent consultants, LLCS Corp., we don't document payroll. We keep what is not used in the course of our business. Uh, how do we document that back during the audit applied for all payroll, not rent or utilities? Okay, so you're saying that you're a like a K1, K1 distributions is your income? Correct. Yeah, we're owners. Okay. Yeah, you know, now my boss called me with a question about that today, and we did not have a good answer. Um, I, I think ultimately, you know, we felt that, um, you know, if, if you can document it, um, you know, that this is the amount that you receive on a monthly basis, that it would be okay. But I don't, I don't have a good answer for that one. We were just talking about it like two hours ago. If I, if I can jump in, um, Adirondack is an S corp. Um, we've been approved for the loan. Um, in our loan documents, we cannot play, pay any distributions as corporation distributions to owners other than to pay for taxes or anything else. So we can't take, in essence, a salary as a distribution and apply those for forgiveness to the PPP loan. That is per our loan document. So I think, I think Greg is asking this similar type of question. I think this is really pertinent to a lot of our members is, okay, so you're an independent contractor, you're a freelancer, you have your own business, you pay yourself. Um, uh, Greg, are you asking that about ownership and 1099 uh, income? Uh, yes. Um, it sounds like the, I'm in the same situation, I, I think as what we're just discussing here. So um, it sounds like that would not apply to covering payroll for myself. Um, in my, in my, uh, I would talk specifically to your bank and ask them what the, what the covenants are in the loan as to what can be used. I would also ask them what is the backup that they're looking for uh, for any type of salary uh, distribution you would take as an S-Corp. I can tell you that was a conversation we had. Um, and, and once again, the specifics were only the, the, the money used towards taxes and so on can be forgiven, but any other distributions during the, the period were not allowable. Uh, we have a couple more questions that just popped in. Um, I, I see the I see the one from Tom. Uh, I would just say, you know, how can Tom asks how can I help the 1099 contractors that work for us regularly? Um, you know, I would provide them with the same information that you're receiving on this um, webcast. Uh, you know, because they can apply um, on their own. So if Tom, if you are submitting an application, you could walk them through the steps that you did to apply and then say, okay, this is what you need to do. You're going to do it just like me because they truly are. They're going to be treated just like you. Um, and all the steps that you're taking, you know, getting in touch with your bank or being, being documented, copies of your driver's license and everything that you need, you know, they should be taking those steps as well and then submitting and staying on top of the banker because they need to be, um, you know, they're going to be applying just like the businesses which employ, pay people W-2 wages. Um, and then Nate Mitchell says, I was told my accountant that if you are an LLC, not a corp, that your net loss profit line on your Schedule C is your number that you would use for payroll. That's what I used when I applied. 
Okay, so an LLC, and you're talking about, so um, Nate, you do not have um, payroll per se? That's correct, yeah. Okay, so you Through just... The money, the money that I make is technically all rolled through, right? Correct? Is that, is that correct or no? What, what your account... Like the you? money that you bring in if you're a sole proprietor LLC, it's all your, in, that's your income basically. Right. Which is exactly. payroll, so yeah. Yeah, I would say treat that in the same way that like a 1099 employee is providing their 2019 1099 and they're saying, this is my income divided by 12 is my monthly income times 2.5 is the maximum loan amount. In a similar way, you would be taking your uh, Schedule C bottom line net income divided by 12 months, that's your average income times two and a half, that's your maximum loan amount. And then over the next, um, you know, eight weeks, you're going to want to demonstrate that, you know, your, if you want full forgiveness, that your, you know, profit has been, or the income that you're bringing to yourself is going to be at a similar level. So Andy, if it's a 1099 independent contractor, they're receiving money from other companies, but they're applying for a loan and then paying themselves for that money. Is that how they would do it? Oh, so they're receiving payment from. Okay. A lot of our, a lot of our members are freelancers for lack of a better term. And they're working for various companies and they're receiving income from these companies, paying their own taxes, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So if they apply and they figured out what their average monthly was for the last 12 months and they've applied for two and a half times that they get the loan. Do they then write themselves checks out of that money that uh, I, I agree with I their average someone, monthly um, income? I, I had someone who um, talked about doing that with me today. He submitted a 1099 for 2019. He only was paid from one company, but he said that he was going to write checks to document the amount. Okay. The amount of his income essentially over the next eight weeks. And he had never done that before, never written checks to himself. Uh, I know that we've probably missed a couple questions. Jenny, did you see any that, um, that we could possibly answer with Andy? I followed up and it seems like we've answered all the ones earlier. Great. Uh, so Andy, would you like to open it up? See if anyone has a question they would ask live versus in the chat. Sure, if we know how to raise their hands. Uh, I think a lot of people are joining us on the phone, um, possibly. But if anyone would like to try using their raise their hand tool, we could call on you. Um, or can unmute yourself and we can just go from there. And the other thing I would say about, you know, some of these unique situations is, you know, I'm not the expert. I don't have all the answers. Um, but when I have been encountering these un unique situations as the applications roll into our credit union, um, you know, I've been, one, referring back to that inter interim final rule, um, and two, Googling, uh, you know, these unique situations because there are a lot of CPA firms that are just posting information up on you know, on their websites. And so, you know, you're, you have a unique situation. You're trying to find out as much information as possible. Um, I'm not going to, I don't have all the answers, but, you know, do as much research as you can talk to your banker when you're submitting it and say, be honest and say, this is what I'm, this is what I'm doing. Does this you know, make sense to you? Um, and then proceed based on that. And I've compiled a list of all the resources that were helpful to me on the visual terrain website and if you scroll down on the left side of the website at the bottom, there's a news section and it's the first item in news. And basically every link, every article, every webinar that I found that was helpful during the last month, I've posted there. And along with any, you know, important impressions I had of it. Um, and people have told me it's, it's helpful. And I sent the same information to the TEA and a lot of it's on the TEA website as well. Um, last week I was on another webinar where um, they mentioned for a lot of people, if you don't have a banking relationship, there is an organization called Venturize.org, and I'll paste that into the chat, 
and they have an extensive list of small business resources, including lenders that will work with new clients. And then there's two online lenders called Lendistry.com and FundingCircle.com. And apparently they're taking on new clients to help them through the PPP and they'll work with independent contractors and freelancers. So those might be resources. Um, I know a lot of TEA members are creatives and they don't like dealing with all the numbers and business stuff. Um, another good resource is um, Small Business Development Center or SBDC. And they're spread all over the United States. They're actually a branch of the SBA. And for free, they will help you with all kinds of major things with your business, including this process. Um, and we had an advisor who was a, a retired CPA. And basically, you know, a week before this was even announced, he said, hey, get your information together. Um, you're going to need it. You're going to be applying for this loan. And um, he helped us be prepared um, even before our bank helped us be prepared. So SBDC is a really great resource that everybody should be using anyway. Um, if you have a relationship with them, um, they'll be able to help you get through these weird times. Um, I, I see the question from Todd. Great. Uh, uh, Todd says you said that not all criteria has been released by the SBA yet, but what documents do you anticipate we will need to provide during the loan forgiveness audit time? What I would say is, um, you know, whatever you based your application on, so if it was just payroll um, and you've provided, you know, quarterly IRS payroll tax statements, they're called 941s, where you report to IRS and say, this is what I paid my people, you're going to want to have something that is like a matching documentation. So whether it is, you know, copies of checks written to employees or a payroll report from your bookkeeping system that sh can demonstrate, okay, this is the amount that was paid to the employees. Um, the more gran granular you can be, the better. So if you have a, the ideal situation would be you had a payroll tax report, or I'm sorry, a payroll report from your bookkeeping system that showed the exact amount that you paid each employee in 2019 or the trailing 12 months, so, you know, March 2019 through March 2020, either of those is acceptable, either of those time periods, and then you had a matching report for the next eight weeks that itemized the exact amount that you paid to each employee over that period. So that would be ideal. Not everyone's going to have that, but you, you want some type of documentation that's going to be, that's going to verify, okay, I based my application on the, these amounts, and here's the documentation that shows, you know, how much I paid and what I expected my average amount to be. And then eight weeks later, you have something matching that you can point to and say, this is actually what I paid. And, you know, here's where you can see it. Similarly with like the utility bills, if you say, I, my utility bill is $1,000 per month, here are my last three statements from the energy company. You know, over the next eight weeks, you're going to get two more utility bills and you provide those and they're going to say, oh yeah, okay, it was you know, $1,000 each month. So you should have matching documentation. Mortgage interest, you know, that's going to be pretty straightforward. If you're asking for that to be covered, you provide your, your bank statements that show how much was applied in a mortgage interest over the past, you know, three months. And then how much did you pay over the next eight weeks? Uh, for, for rent, if you're asking for rent to be covered, you should include a copy of your lease. And then you can Hopefully, you know, if you set up that separate bank account, you can show the, the uh, rent payments being paid to your landlord over the next eight weeks. That's the type of matching documentation that I'm talking about. And actually, speaking of rent and mortgages, Andy, um, I wanted to mention to everybody, this, was, this has kind of been lost in the news cycle, that the SBA is forgiving mortgage payments for SBA 504 loans for the next six months. So if you own your building or you're buying your building, um, look into that. In my case, um, the, the April 1st payment was not taken out of my bank account like it normally would be, but I checked with the bank and they said, oh, it will be, you have to put in a stop payment request. And if you put that in, they'll stop the payment for the next six months. And if you're renting your building, you're not leasing it, talk to your landlord and see if they're buying it through a loan because they may forgive you the rent if they're going to get reimbursed for it themselves, if they want to be nice to you. Um, and you can explain that you're having a tough time and you don't wanna, you know, you're not going to pay the rent. They may be willing to work with you on that. I, I had a client contact me today who has an SBA loan. He did not specify whether it was an SBA 7A loan or 504 loan, which is a real estate loan. Um, but he received a notification from another bank. Uh, and the, it said, it was, a, it was on the bank letterhead, but it said, 
the SBA will be covering your loan payment. So they were, this bank was notified because they have the SBA guarantee. The SBA is reaching out to the banking partners and saying, okay, these are SBA loans that you have on the books. We are going to cover that loan payment for the next six months. So I don't know if anyone's in that situation, but that's obviously very nice. That's very nice. Um, well, we have just oh, a few. I, I, I had one other point, which is uh, if you have existing loans with your bank, you may contact them and say, and you've been severely disrupted by the crisis. You may contact them and say, can I get a payment deferral, full payment deferral or interest only payments for a period of two months or three months. And now is the time that they will be very receptive. So you may be able to get that. That's not through the SBA or anything. That would just be your bank being nice to you. But they, you know, they are, they're in a position where they kind of have to take those requests seriously. So make the request if you need it. Don't ask, don't get. Awesome. Um, we do have one last quick question from John there at the bottom. Uh, if you didn't get into round one of EIDL, do you know if, we have to take any action to stay, con I can't read it, it's too small, to stay in the contention. In contention. It's, it's yeah. similar to the curious question about the PPP, you know, that we, we applied and the funds dried up five days later. Uh -huh. um, so I didn't know if we need to do anything new with the EIDL, which is the, the disaster loan that had the $10,000 advance. So that loan is applied for directly through the SBA. And I'm sure you know that because you applied, correct? Yes. Okay. So, you know, I have not processed one EIDL loan because we don't do them. You know, you go right through the SBA. But I would contact, you know, how, however you submitted, you know, I would go through there and say, hey, I applied for this. Do I need to submit another one? If you can't get the SBA on the phone, which is very likely because I know that they are overloaded too, you may just submit another application. But I don't know. I mean, I would, you know, read the rules on that again, be informed, and then, you know, make the best judgment based on the information that you can get. But be persistent, like David said, and try and find out where the application stands. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I realize it's not your business, but I didn't know if you had heard anything. And when the new round of money, I guess, is getting released, I'm sure they'll post more information. So, John, also that the rules changed on that. After it started, it was ten thousand dollars per company. Got changed to one thousand dollars per employee. Yeah. Okay. Also, when we applied, we applied for the EIDL ten thousand dollar grant. We also applied for the bigger EIDL loan, um, which our advisors have since told us not to accept it because it'll conflict with the PPP loan. But if you've applied for EIDL. Um, the first time you apply, it was like a long process. It was a two and a half hour application. Then a few days later, I got a notice from the SBA saying, we revised the application, it's faster now, you must reapply. And then it was a 10 minute long application. And then yeah. that one was appro approved about 10 days later. Um, and we've been told not to accept it. So um, I definitely do have to, if you, yeah, if you haven't reapplied, reapply. Yeah. Um, I have a couple other little notes I wanted to mention here. There's a group called the Small Business Majority. Um, it's a lobbying group in Washington for small businesses. If you're not aware of it, go to their website and sign up. Um, I've got a lot of really good notices from them. Um, they, they are really keeping up to date with everything that's going on and trying to influence the, our legislators to try and uh, you know, make these things accessible for us. Um, and one of the things that's helpful is they send out a lot of emails letting you know about other grants. Um, Spanx had a grant for women entrepreneurs. Verizon had a grant for small businesses. The LA County Chamber of Commerce had a grant, um, $5,000 grant. They're mostly intended for smaller firms, um, you know, less than 25 employees or in some cases less than 10 employees. Um, but those grants come up, there's usually only a few hundred at a time. But if you're a small business and you're you know, trying to figure out how to survive, keep an eye out for those because they're, they're, I've been seeing about one or two a week um, since this all started. What was the group again, David? The Small Business Majority. It's uh, smallbusinessmajority.org. We had an Illinois-based version of that. Yeah, I saw that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, 
that's all the time we have for today, guys. But thank you all so much for joining us, and we hope that this was helpful. Um, if you have any questions or if you want to follow up with us, you can email us at memberservices at teaconnect.org. Um, yeah, we hope that you all found this helpful. Thank you for joining us.